Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. I'm all my day. The film Ithaca, the title taken from a poem by C.P. Cavafy, chronicles the slow motion torture and execution of the Australian journalist Julian Assange, currently awaiting extradition to the United States in a high security prison in London. It charts his journey from publisher of the most important revelations of our generation, of fraud, war crimes, lies, and corruption by the powerful, to his refuge for seven years in the Ecuadorian embassy in London from 2012 to 2019, his seizure and arrest by British police who enter the embassy to detain him, and the harsh imprisonment he is enduring in Belmarsh High Security Prison, where he is currently fighting a U.S. extradition request. It unflinchingly portrays the terrible emotional cost to him and his family, including his father John, his wife Stella, and their two young children. The film, directed by Ben Lawrence and produced by Julian's brother, Gabriel Shipton, pits Julian and his family and his supporters against the opaque, ruthless, and monolithic power of nation-states, including Sweden, Great Britain, and the United States, and more importantly, the intelligence services that have long sought to silence and crush Julian in retribution. Julian is largely absent from the film, isolated in the high-security prison, and only able to communicate through periodic phone calls, some of which are filmed. In Cavafy's poem, The Wanderer Odysseus departs Troy for the long and perilous journey back to Ithaca, replicating the journey John is making to recover and restore the life of his son. Cavafy warns us in the poem not to allow the evil forces that conspire against us turn us to into monsters, to keep Ithaca always in your mind. Cavafy writes, As you set out for Ithaca, Hope your road is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. Lastragonian, Cyclops, angry Poseidon, don't be afraid of them. You'll never find things like that on your way as long as you keep your thoughts raised high, as long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. Lastragonian, Cyclops, wild Poseidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul unless your soul sets them up in front of you. Joining me to discuss Ithaca is Gabriel Shipton. So I, I told you before we started, Gabriel, I think what makes the film is your father, whose every question he gets asked is just elliptical and profound and, uh, you know, wonderfully off the mark from, I think, what the questioner intended. Um, but I know the impetus for the film came from a visit you made with your brother, which was quite distressing. Uh, he was in the medical unit on suicide watch. Uh, and we should be clear that when you're in the medical unit of Belmarsh Prison, uh, it doesn't look anything like a hospital ward. I think they call it the hell ward, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's uh, right. But let's start from there. Well, that was uh, in 2019. Um, Julian had been taken from his uh, refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy uh, in April of that year. Uh, he was taken by the UK police and put in the maximum security prison at Belmarsh. And during that period, uh, he was, as you said, kept in the health wing, um, which the prisoners call the hell wing. Uh, and it's the place where you have the most suicidal, uh, chronically ill, terminally ill prisoners. Uh, one of the prisoner in the cell next door to Julian actually had no arms and no legs. Uh, you know, people dying of cancer. It, it is a um, incredibly, uh, you know, depressing uh, place, e even within the you know the prison system there. So it was uh, at that time that I went to see him with 
John Pilger and my father, John Shipton. And I'd never seen him in, in the state that I found him there that day. Uh, I'd never seen him like that before. Uh, he was, uh, even, you know, even in the darkest times, uh, in the Ecuadorian embassy, um, when, you know, everything was being surveilled, uh, you know, the, uh, microphones, uh, high definition cameras, uh, you know, murder plots, uh, the CIA murder plots, even, even in, at those times when, when there was these forces, uh, and you could feel them inside the Ecuadorian embassy when you were there, you know, Julian would have to turn on a, a, a jammer in, when you went to see him to, uh, jam the microphones. Uh, so there was that very much, you could feel the surveillance, you could feel the forces, uh, that were surveilling him and watching him. And even, even at that time, Julian was not like I saw him that day in the prison. And so after that visit, uh, it, it was, you know, an, an intense two hour visit with John Pilger and, and my father. And after that visit, uh, I left the prison that day thinking that, you know, I might not see him again. Uh, it, 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 he was that bad that I thought this could be the last time uh, that I ever see Julian. And that sort of set me on, on this, how, how do I, uh, contribute to, uh, the campaign to free him? And I'm a film producer. I, I produce, uh, usually I produce, uh, scripted drama films. And so I started to think about a film, you know, how could we tell, uh, tell this side of the story, tell our side of the story, the family side of the story and Julian's side of the story, uh, in an emotional way, in a sort of, uh, using sort of traditional storytelling really to tell, um, to tell a sort of, uh, you know, take people on a journey and, and not just, uh, not just a, a regular documentary with interviews and things like that, but really take people, uh, on an emotional, uh, an emotional journey because, I believe that's how people connect, you know, we connect as humans, right? Like we, uh, that's how we connect, I think, best with these stories as human beings first. And then, uh, and then we start to think, you know, if we have that emotional connection, we start to start to really analyze and think about the situation that's going on. So at that time, um, John, my father was, uh, traveling around Europe, uh, you know, going from place to place, you know, meeting with supporters, meeting with the grassroots, doing interviews all over Europe. Uh, he was going into parliaments and, and really, uh, on the road, uh, all the time. So we started to follow John and I think that was in August, 2019, we started to follow John with a, a single camera, our, our cinematographer, Niels Laderfug, uh, he and John, uh, would you know, basically be attached at the hip and travel around the place. And, and, and Nils, you know, captured all this beautiful, intimate footage, uh, with John. And so that's really how the, you know, how we got the, how we started, uh, you know, with the film and, and it was from then on, uh, a sort of almost a year later that, um, the d director, Ben Lawrence, uh, came on board and, uh, we've sort of really ramped things up uh, into the main hearing, uh, which was, uh, in October of 2020. So that's when we sort of really ramp, ramp things up and, 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 you know, got more cameras on to, to really cover and document this, uh, historical moment in history. And these two, uh, people who were at the center of, of this, uh, of this historical trial, uh, John, my father, and Stella Assange, who's now Julian's wife. Uh, interestingly, when we started uh, filming, uh, Stella was still, uh, you know, uh, Julian's secret family. Nobody knew uh, that Stella and Julian uh, had two children uh, and that they had been in a relationship. And so it was only through uh, some court documents that uh, ju the judge refused to uh, withhold Stella's name, uh, which led to Stella, you know, coming out as it were and, and stepping into the spotlight and becoming one of, you know, uh, an unequaled 
advocate for Julian uh, as she is today. Uh, she's incredible, and and we covered a, a lot of that a lot of that journey for her. You know, we we followed her during that period, uh, and that's all uh, in the film as well. So it's sort of as things unfolded, um, you know, the film changed shape. It was a going to be a single single uh, you know person single character sort of journey, and then. Uh, you know, Stella came forth and, and we really wanted to uh, show that side of the story too because uh, it's a really nice way to humanize Julian and really learn uh, about Julian through the people who love him. Uh, usually we understand Julian through, or the public understand Julian through the headlines, uh, through interviews that he's done that are often... Um, you know, Julian's often the antagonist in these interviews. And so it's through those interviews that the public understand him. But it's, we understand Julian, his family understand Julian as a loving father, a husband, um, you know, a, a son, a brother, uh, you know, who has dorky jokes, who can't dance and, and all these sorts of things. So these were really nice ways to use, uh, you know, use these journeys to really humanize Julian and show a different side of him that the public uh, has never seen before. I want to pick up on that word humanize um, because it's important. I think part of the campaign against Julian is not only to demonize him, isolate him. Three years now in Belmarsh Prison, seven years in the Ecuadorian embassy, but uh, to make sure that he is dehumanized, that any uh, other side of Julian other than what is presented by the dominant media narrative is shut out. And I saw that as one of the great benefits of the film. The other uh, powerful element of the film, I think, and I know because I teach in a prison, is that when a close family member is incarcerated, in some sense, the family on the outside is incarcerated as well. And I think that you pick that up, uh, that kind of stress uh, that – whether it's in prison visits or phone calls or constant worrying and preoccupation, you see it with Stella about how are you, how is your health? And I think that that film did a very good job of uh, dealing with both of those two issues. Yeah, so this dehumanization of Julian, it's, it's really, it really serves the persecution of Julian. It allows the public uh, to sort of switch off. Um, you know, this isn't happening to a human being. People can say, well, uh, you know, Julian hasn't been able to attend his own uh, court proceedings uh, since January 2021. Uh, he applies to attend the court proceeding and the applications are refused, uh, not given a reason. And this is really to uh, take Julian from view, take him uh, from view. Uh, you know the, the the classic photos that often appear of Julian are the ones of him traveling to and forth uh, from the prison to the court. And uh, even those moments uh, have been taken away. You know the, he's been dehumanized to that level that uh, those photos uh, inside the prison van uh, have have been taken away. He is also. Part of that. Well, they, didn't they block the wind? They blocked the windows, didn't they? They colored the windows over so you couldn't. Photographers couldn't shoot in. Is that correct? Well, they you can you you the photographers hold up the uh, camera and they you know the flash goes in, but they don't really they can't really see. But you can you know you can get a photo. That's what that's those there's those photos of Julian with uh, you know the uh, a long beard you know uh, with these hand signs and things like that. They're from the uh, prison. Uh, the prison van that goes back and forth from the court, but he hasn't been allowed to attend his own court proceedings uh, in person since since that date. And yeah, that's that's part of this process of dehumanization that allows for this pers you know it allows for this persecution. It's one of the you know elements of this persecution, his dehumanization. So yeah, it was really important for us to you know really l lean into this humanistic side of. of of this story and, and, and humanize Julian in that sense. And I, I, you know, the, 
it's when you know you talk about the families who are suffering uh, or you know how the families experience the incarceration of Julian and you know, Stella talks about going to visit Julian and the procedure that uh, that her and her children have to go through to enter the court uh, enter the visitors area uh, and it is it is oppressive and and there's two little children in this, you know, a three and a five-year-old whose mouths are searched, uh, who uh, have sniffer dogs sniffing at a hair. You know, a, a big German shepherd dog comes up to the child and, and sniffs the back of their head. Uh, so these sort of moments, you know, it has an effect. It has a, an effect on the family. It has an effect on these children. Uh, and I think it's deliberate, you know, it's very deliberate that Julian's been kept in the maximum security prison. Uh, it's very deliberate that his family has to go through this procedure. They have to feel uh, this persecution uh, uh, as well as Julian. Not, not, uh, I'm, I'm not, it's not equal to what Julian's going through, but, you know, as you say, uh, the families of those who are incarcerated are in a way incarcerated as well. I wanted to. There's a moment in the film where John, your father, expresses the fear that they're trying to kill Julian. Um, and I know the family has always been very reluctant to speak about the psychological and medical condition of your brother. However, in the court proceedings, uh, there was much that was revealed uh, about his physical and psychological state. And I don't want to push you too hard on this, but at least if you can relate the information that came out in court. Um, and it, because it, it, there's a clear deterioration, and, and, and I think many of us feel that's by design. Well, um, I can describe it how I, I observe it uh, when I go and see Julian, or uh, I saw him last October. You know, probably I don't get to see him that often. Obviously, our family's been torn apart, so... I live in Australia, so I, whenever I'm in the UK, I make sure that I go to see him at the prison, obviously. But the de the gradual deterioration uh, over the years uh, that he's been kept in there is uh, very, very obvious uh, to me. You know, physical, his physical well-being, uh, his uh, mental well-being, uh, as well as the obvious, the expert testimony, expert witness testimony. Um, but yeah, over the years, you can see um, that he is uh, in gradual decline. And he had obviously had this uh, stroke, minor stroke at the end of last year. And, and the effects of that don't, uh, you don't just have a, a, you know, it doesn't just go away. Uh, this minor stroke is evidence that uh, this whole never-ending uh, procedure, these oppressive prison conditions, are really taking its toll on uh, his body physically uh, that, that has pushed him to have this sort of episode. So that's how I see it. Um, you know, we when I go and visit him, we, we try and you know, have a, have a laugh. We try and joke and, and we try and talk about lighter things or I, I know I do. Obviously we always tell him about what's going on in the world. Uh, you know, who's said to say hello, you know, which of his old friends that we've met around the place, but those, uh, visits, uh, you know, precious times when, um, you know, we can sort of uh, be together as as we once were, and and joke and laugh and and um, forget, try and forget all the troubles that exist that exist around him. I just want to list some of the uh, examples of his deterioration that were made public in the court, uh, and that was uh, distressing behavior, hallucinations. I think banging his head against the wall at one point, uh, calling the Samaritan hotline, which is about suicide. Um, uh, he's lost, I believe, quite a bit of weight. 
Um, and there are were moments uh, in the video proceedings where he was not, it appeared not quite sure of where he was. Uh, I think this is uh, what, what happened to anyone who uh, was under this kind of stress. We see what isolation does to normal, healthy people in uh, a prison system. Uh, and uh, everyone, of course, has a breaking point. Uh, Niels Melzer, uh, the special UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, has called the conditions under which Julian are, is, being, are, is living at, at torture. He's defined it as torture. Uh, and uh, um, I wondered if you could uh, address uh, the issue of how the UK prison system is configuring an environment that essentially perpetuates uh, this kind of pressure. Well, another, I mean, Nils Meltzer also said, you know, it was a slow motion murder before our eyes is, is what was yeah. happening to Julian. That's yeah. how he described it. Uh, that's um, not my words, those are his. Uh, the prison system in the UK, uh, so Belmarsh uh, is a maximum security prison. Uh, there are 800 or so prisoners there. 20% uh, of the prisoners in Belmarsh uh, convicted murderers. Uh, they're the most violent, uh, violent prisoners in all the UK. Uh, there are, Julian is one of two uh, prisoners there who are on remand. So uh, remand, you know, uh, it, it sounds sort of, you know, it's a bit of a technical term, but basically what it means is uh, he, Julian's not convicted of any crime. So he's been present in that prison uh, it will be four years in April, uh, and and he hasn't been uh, convicted of a crime. He's not serving a sentence. Uh, he has just been kept there uh, at the request of the US DOJ. So it's uh, this uh, torturous system that's been set up to break to break Julian. This never-ending legal process. Uh, Julian doesn't know he could be in that prison. For another three or four years, or, or they, he just has no idea, or he could be out on an airplane, you know, tomorrow, uh, being extradited to the U.S. So it's uh, it's this system that's been set up to keep Julian in a permanent state, a permanent state of anxiety of whether he will be extradited to a country uh, whose intelligence community has uh, plotted to kill him, uh, whose uh, Secretary of State called for him to be droned. Uh, that that is being held over Julian's head every day, or every single day, and and this is this is the the system uh, that has been set up. The system that has been set up to uh, really break Julian, break him, uh, break his uh, mind, uh, and break his body, and. I think those the, that evidence that you know obviously it's very hard for me to uh, talk about those that 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 expert uh, testimony and those events that you brought up, but though that's the evidence of of this system uh, working against Julian, a and same with the physical ailments that he has, uh, like the weight loss, uh, these the minor stroke, uh, and, and these other things. These are all. Uh, symptoms of uh, this uh, slow motion murder that Julian is is going through. So, do you think that the persecution of Julian is designed to send a message to any other journalist that might attempt to do what he did? Yeah, I certainly uh, do believe that uh, that is the purpose of Julian's persecution. If you look at uh, all the support that Julian has around the world. Uh, you have the Latin, Latin, basically every Latin American leader uh, is now calling for Julian to be released. The Australian Prime Minister has uh, made representations to the Biden administration and said so publicly uh, that enough is enough. Um, you know, Julian has suffered enough and that he should be released. Those are the words of the Prime Minister. Uh, every major civil society uh, NGO 
the press freedom NGO, uh, human rights NGO in the US has called on the, uh, the Garland DOJ to drop the charges against Julian. Uh, you have those five uh, legacy uh, newspapers that collaborated with WikiLeaks uh, from all around the world. The New York Times uh, being the US uh, leader there, uh, calling on the Garland DOJ to drop the charges uh, against Julian and saying that he should be released. Uh, but Julian still remains in, in prison. And so this message, uh, this message is, I believe, heard very clearly around the world that even if you have the support of, you know, six, seven world leaders and counting, uh, all the major newspapers around the world, uh, every single civil society, uh, press freedom and, and human rights group, uh, that we can do this to you. We can take away your rights. Uh, Julian, I think, has a, over 100 lawyers, uh, but it doesn't seem to matter uh, because uh, the people who are doing this to Julian uh, can act with impunity, and it is a show of strength. It is uh, them showing us that if you expose our secrets, uh, that this is what will happen to you. We will take away every single right you have. Uh, we will destroy you. Uh, you will have to spend millions and millions of dollars defending yourself and uh, it won't come to naught. So I think it is an exceptional uh, an exceptional execution of, of this example that has been shown to the world that this is what will happen if you go against us. There's a moment in the film, you filmed during the extradition, hearings. Uh, Julian is not extradited, not because uh, Judge Baritza finds uh, any of the charges against him specious or wrong, uh, but because of his grave psychological condition and the fact that he is a suicide risk, the United States appealed that uh, decision uh, and, uh, and uh, that uh, appeal was upheld in, in essence uh, overturning her decision, uh, and, uh, and Julian, we're now waiting to see if Julian is allowed to appeal the other points uh, that uh, she, uh, where she ruled against him. But there's a moment there where after that ruling, uh, there's a picture of Stella at home and she has candles on the table and uh, she is uh, apparently awaiting for Ju Julian to be released on bail. I never thought Julian would be released on bail ever for a moment. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious about that moment, what you thought, what the family thought, uh, given the long uh, legal farce. Uh, I mean, the fact that uh, he was filmed by UC Global, a Spanish security firm working for the CIA, all his meetings were with his lawyers were filmed and turned over to the CIA, eviscerating attorney client privilege alone should have invalidated the trial. And then uh, there are all sorts of other strange anomalies when given to the fact that he's charged under the Espionage Act and he's not a U.S. citizen. Um, uh, but what did you think at that moment? Did, did, you, did you believe that he was coming out on bail? And uh, I'm curious, I'm really curious about, uh, you know, what everyone was feeling at that moment. Well, uh, I'm quite uh, similar to you, quite pessimistic uh, about um, about what's going on and, and and Julian's persecution and and the forces that are behind it and how how much power they have and how much, how they wield it. But that doesn't make me less uh, of a human being. <laughs> you know, we 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 want we always want the best uh, to happen, and if there's even a a slight glimmer of hope uh, that Julian might come home, then you know we grab onto that, and and you know for better or for worse, uh, you know we uh, we want to believe that you know that 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 could be a possibility, and I think we wouldn't be doing what we are doing if we didn't uh, believe that Julian would one day uh, be reunited with his family, so. In that sense, you know, I think you have to plan. You know, if 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 Julian was released that day, and 
there was no nothing to welcome him home, um, I, I think that that would have been, you know, not a very nice welcome back. But uh, it is it is a yeah. A, it was a very moving mo- mm, moment. It's a roller coaster. Uh, it, it's a an emotional roller coaster, and you know sometimes you wonder is is that part of you know raising the hope and then uh, crushing it. You sometimes you wonder is that part of mm. is that part of the uh, persecution? You know, trying to uh, fool the emotions of the of the people who love Julian, the activists who are supporting him. Uh, all around the world, you know, to really make them feel uh, that that this could be resolved, and then and then crush that feeling. So uh, I guess at the moment, uh, there's I, d- I don't know if you saw a report by Australian journalist John Lyons. Uh, he was uh, quite a prominent journalist in Australia, and he was on the ABC, which is the public broadcaster in Australia, on New Year's Day, and one of his uh, predictions for 2023 uh, was that Julian would be uh, released unconditionally and that he expects an announcement to come in the next two months. So it's moments like that that uh, when you hear those things, you can't help but uh, grab onto them uh, and and really feel that, you know, the work that Stella's been doing the work that John's been doing, the work that everyone's been doing around the world, all the activists, uh, journalists reporting on it, uh, politicians, is actually having an effect. So, yeah, I I am pessimistic, but also, you know, I can't, you know, I think can't help but have some faith that uh, Julian will one one day be reunited with us. Just to close. You and John, I think, will be in the United States when, and these will be showings of the film. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. We will be uh, starting at the beginning of March uh, on the West Coast, uh, and we will be showing, traveling with the film, doing event screenings all over the U.S. uh, during March and April, and really just getting in front of people and and talking about the film, answering questions, uh, just you know creating awareness around around Julian's case uh, all around the country. We did a similar tour in June 2021 uh, and uh, 2023. We're going to uh, have another go and uh, really just take it to the people in that sense. Um, uh, try and, uh, John always says, uh, we, we can't rely on the, on the mainstream media to do it for us. So we've got to really go out there and uh, just talk to people one at a time, tell them about Julian's case and and get it get people talking about it again. And then the movie and Ithaca is a great tool for that. And where can people find that schedule on what website? Ithaca.movie is uh, the film website, Ithaca.movie, and uh, you can find uh, all the US screenings will be uh, up up there shortly. Great. I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Granadino, Adam Coley, David Hebden, Darian Jones, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrisedges.substack.com.